Now, when we talk about what is evolution, right, a lot of people use evolution, that term, to mean a lot of different things. And I want to focus on sort of three ways it's used scientifically first, um, and then on a way that's used philosophically, okay? So some people, when they use the term evolution, are uh, referring to historical evolution. So that means that the Earth was 4.5 billion years old. Um, if you look back um, at uh, the organisms that live on Earth, if you look 500 million years ago, there's going to be a certain set of organisms. That's going to be different than the organisms that you're going to find in the fossil record 200,000 years ago, which is going to be different than 50 million years ago and so forth. Okay? All it's saying is that there's organisms that have, that, that have changed, uh, that, uh, that exist on Earth have changed over time, some have gone extinct, um, and that the Earth is old. And there's certain pieces of evidence that could demonstrate this, so dating the rocks, finding fossils in certain layers that we know are this old, can give you a good scientific evidence for historical evolution. Okay? The second level is a common descent. Uh, some of them refer to common descent evolution. Right? And this is the idea that all organisms are connected via common ancestry. Okay. At this level, you're not um, uh, explaining how this common ancestry can be explained. You're saying that they're all related by common descent. Okay? And there's another sort of uh, set of evidence that you would do, uh, have to assemble to make, make this point. Um, it requires historical evolution to be supported. So it's sort of a layer of a cake. One layer depends on the other. So common descent depends upon historical evolution being correct. Um, I think one of the best pieces of evidence for common descent, not so much universal, but at least for the tree that we're going to be looking at, if you look here at the hominid um, branches here um, with uh, humans um, and modern chimps and uh, the other great apes, one of the best pieces of evidence for common descent is things called processed pseudogenes, right? So a lot of people use DNA evidence, uh, the similarities in DNA and genes and so forth, but I think this is the best because there's no functional reason for this. You can't explain this by, well, this is just the best function and God made everything the best way. So processed pseudogenes, just briefly, is that you can see up here, uh, the, the, I'm gonna walk over here and just point this out. <laughs> so here's a gene on a chromosome. Um, and it, it, it's got these exons and introns in it. So when it gets converted from DNA to RNA to make the protein here, you splice out the introns. In the average human gene, there's about nine to 10 of them. But you get this processed RNA right here. Right? And this is usually used to make a protein. But in some cases, this thing can be converted back to DNA by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And when it gets converted back to DNA, it can be reinserted somewhere else in the genome. Now, this processed pseudogene can't be used because the instructions to turn it on are not there, right? Because those instructions to turn it on are only in front of the gene over here. So when it gets inserted over here, it's sort of useless. And what happens is over time, it starts to decay. Mutations will accumulate in it. They're not going to be selected for or against because they're, they're, they're neutral. So it accumulates mutations at a regular rate. And based on the number of mutations that have accumulated, you can, guess, you can uh, figure out the age of these, right? So they're not only they're non-functional, but you have a way of, uh, of determining how old they are. When did they first originate? And if you look at the more recent ones, ones there's one pseudogene. It's about 11 million years old based on how uh, mutated it is. Right? <laughs> the most recent one you find in the exact same place in humans, chimps, and gorillas. Some of the older ones, this one here is about 25 million years old, means there's, there's more mutations have accumulated in it. You see it not only in humans, chimps, and gorillas, but also in orangutans and rheus monkeys. So you, you, it, it, the older ones, you find in a more diverse group of, uh, of primates. So there's no functional reason for these here. There's sort of, sort of dead DNA that's been inherited. And I think the best explanation, most parsimonious explanation, is that it occurred once and a common ancestor to all, you know, this, this one here, occur, this <coughs> process pseudogene occurred sometime about 36 million years ago in the common ancestor of all these and was inherited by all of them. And there isn't, um, you know, the only other way to explain it is sort of, there's usually just ad hoc ways of explaining it. So, so the simplest, most parsimonious is common descent. Right. The third um, sort of use of the term uh, evolution, let me refer to Darwinian evolution. Right. And this is the level where I think most of the, uh, the conflict arises, although some people have problems with all three of them, right? Um, but this, this, I think, is, is where most of the conflict arises. And this is where you're talking about the mechanisms, right? So 
Darwinian evolution is that that common descent that we just talked about can be explained by natural mechanisms. Okay? Um, so pure Darwinian evolution would say natural selection is the, main, is the only mechanism. Very few biologists believe that. Most believe that it's the most prominent mechanism, but there's other natural mechanisms as well. But the key is it's natural causes that scientists can study would explain how the common ancestor of modern humans and modern chimps split and on this lineage changes occurred via natural selection to get to modern humans. Okay? All three of these are scientific theories. They're making scientific claims about the material way that the human body evolved and how it's connected to other organisms. What <laughs> becomes a problem often in literature is when you start to use evolution in a different way. Right? So the term evolution becomes problematic in this debate when it's used as a philosophy. Right? So you have the atheistic Darwinian philosophy which says the human person is nothing more than the product of evolution. So it's saying, yeah, natural selection, so, so in the previous slide, right, it say, well, Darwinian evolution would say that natural selection is the primary mechanism by which the human body evolved, right? But then if you add to that, and that explains everything about the human person, right? It's one of those theories that nothing more, we're nothing more than that. That <laughs> denies the reality of the immaterial aspect of man, and is obviously not a scientific theory. There is no scientific experiment that you can do to demonstrate that that position is correct, right? And so often scientists will say evolution demonstrates God doesn't exist or there is no soul. Well, science can't demonstrate any of that, right? Can't go and do an experiment to demonstrate the reality or immaterial, reality or non-reality of the human soul, the reality or non-reality of God. And this is where the conflicts start to arise, but it's not a science faith conflict, right? It's a philosophy versus another philosophy conflict, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Right?